Hello, and welcome back to Time 100 Talks. I'm Alice Park, Senior Health Correspondent for Time, and I'm now joined by UNICEF Executive Director Henrietta Four, and actress, producer, and UNICEF Goodwill Ambassador Priyanka Chopra Jonas. Henrietta and Priyanka, welcome to Time 100 Talks. Thank you so much, Alice. So nice to be here. It is indeed. Thank you, Alice. Priyanka, I want to start with you. You've been a UNICEF Goodwill Ambassador since 2016 and have traveled around the world meeting children and hearing directly from them about their challenges. Um, I'd like to start by asking from those conversations, what has stood out to you as far as things that children have said that are important to them and that we as adults are not really addressing to their satisfaction? I think it's amazing um, that the children around the world have such a strong opinion on what is happening to the world because eventually they're the ones who are going to inherit it from us. And um, uh, I've been working with UNICEF since 2016, but I was a national ambassador for UNICEF in India as well for almost a decade. And having worked with children in um, in a country, um, you know, that is that has so many crises in general um, and then having gone to travel to refugee camps and having traveled around the world and met children, I think the one thing all of them really, really implore upon is an education, um, no matter what their circumstances are, even if they are in refugee camps where they don't even have access to formal education or papers, the one thing that they want is their right to an education. Um, and. And also I, I've had innumerable conversations with um, children who are so impacted by the climate crisis. And I think we as adults are not really taking it as seriously as we should. Um, the climate crisis and the world in, as it is, is going to be inherited by them. And they have a very, very strong opinion about it. And, and you know, they talk very, very clearly about the fact that this world needs to be protected and saved for them. And um, I, in fact, recently just had a conversation with a 16 year old advocate from India um, who has been working on um, getting rid of single use plastics like straws, et cetera, within the country and has managed to, uh, within his own community, get rid of about 26 million straws um, in just two years. And he had, when he, he was so inspiring to me because he said, you know, I'm 16 years old when all of you guys are gone, that's going to be my prime. And what is the world that you're leaving behind for me? Um, and hearing it from kids is just so in incredible, you know, because they have they have a perspective that I, I guess we don't hear as much, or at least countries around the world don't hear as much. When I'm traveling, I also hear about education. And what they say is, I want a modern education. I don't necessarily want the education that you all have had. I want something that looks forward. So I need foundational skills, but I need entrepreneurial skills. I may have to create a job for myself. And I want some skills that are occupational and I need digital skills and I need it now because there are a lot of jobs that are just disappearing and I'm not sure that they're going to be jobs there for me. So to Priyanka's thought, I think young people are asking a lot of us that we've just got to listen to and then see if we can't help them and create that sort of a world and that legacy for them. Speaking of that legacy, Henrietta, UNICEF is coming up on its 75th anniversary next year. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the original goals and mission of UNICEF uh, when it was founded and how have those priorities evolved over the years? Are the urgent needs that you're seeing uh, still essentially the same? Are they changing? Um, how, has, how have things changed since UNICEF was founded? Well, in a way, childhood has changed, Alice. So 75 years ago, the world was just coming out of war and there were so many children that had lost their parents, their homes, their communities and they needed to rebuild uh, their lives and we needed to help rebuild their lives. And if you fast forward now 75 years later, our technologies and tools are very modern and sophisticated in comparison, but a child's heart and needs are often very much the same. So we are doing many of the same things, focusing on nutrition and health and education and water and sanitation and protection. And yet we're doing lots of new modern things, thinking about artificial intelligence, 
for children that are differently abled. And it's a remarkable world out there. Um, Priyanka mentioned who she spoke to for World Children's Day. And I spoke to a, a girl who is a young scientist. She's 14 and she's developed a novel way of combating the COVID virus. Well, they're a remarkable generation and we just have to help them open up opportunities for them. And just to add to Henrietta Mem's point, like seeing um, children in, you know, countries, developing worlds where they don't even have access to Wi-Fi at the moment. So, you know, with the pandemic happening and so many kids being taken out of school and, you know, their education depending um, on Wi-Fi or even cell phones, which, you know, poor children around the world don't have access to. Now, these children, when they're, they anyway have these problems in a normal world. Now you add the pandemic to it. Most of these kids are probably not going to return, specifically the girls. They're probably not going to be able to come back to school. They're going to have issues such as child marriage, um, you know, child labor that will come into play. Um, and, you know, a lot of like sexual violence against girls is on a rise because with the restrictions and these girls not having the freedom and the safety to go to school, they're in their homes most of the times with, you know, their violators. So there are so many issues that um, I, it's so exciting for me to see the kind of work that UNICEF has done and continues to do when it comes to, um, you know, children, their health, their, just their general life, um, that it's, it's, it takes my heart, it gives my heart so much joy to hear um, um, the executive director say that right now, that there, this is an extraordinary um, generation of children, but there is an extraordinary crisis against them too. There are so many children who are in refugee camps, living under the poverty line, and especially with the pandemic right now, we've seen such a rise in poverty, about 140 million people will fall into household poverty right now. And these are kids, which is a completely lost generation. And it's so important for us to realize and recognize that these children will have an impact on what the world will look like. And the decisions we take right now will impact them the most. And it seems for both of you, you've touched on this a bit, but I wanted to delve a little bit deeper. Um, it seems that the pandemic has only highlighted, right? The, and put into starker relief, the wide range of challenges that young people face around the world. But sometimes crisis can bring action. So has, in your view, has the pandemic helped to bring more attention to some of these areas and allowed countries to address them more effectively? Have you seen that? I'd love to hear from both of you from your own experience there. Um, so le let me begin on that because we have seen a renewed urgency and commitment from a number of countries. And it usually centers around education. And it's to Priyanka's point. Often there are children in their countries, maybe half or more who do not have connectivity. So when the schools closed and the teachers were no longer there, children's learning simply stopped. There was not enough thought given to remote or distance learning, whether it's by radio or television or an SMS on your cell phone or a tablet or the internet. And if it is a low or low, lower or middle income country, it's often that the teachers themselves did not have access to any of those um, cap capabilities. So Governments are now relooking at their budget. Some have had a stay in interest payments on debt, and they're thinking about how to invest for the future. And of course, children are a great investment and education is probably the best ladder out of poverty. So investing in uh, connecting every school to the internet in the world and every learner and every teacher is starting to pick up a lot of interest around the world. And we think it can mean that our world can emerge from COVID stronger and more forward thinking and future thinking and with a much more equal playing field for children. But this is one area that I think it's a once in a generation opportunity. This could be a big leap forward for the world. 
And I'd just love to add to that. I mean, it's just a simple statistic that I think about. I understand that the governments have to look out for the economies of the countries, but when you can have bars and restaurants open, we can safely figure out a way to get children back to school. And I was so excited about hearing that UNICEF is actually imploring governments to reopen schools in a safe way by having smaller um, classrooms or by staggering timings in which children can come to school. But I mean, if we have the ability to go to a restaurant, we have to be able to prioritize, you know, and, and, and understand what the priorities should be and an entire generation of children not being able to get an education for a really long time is a big priority. What lessons can we learn, do you think, from young people about tackling a big issue like climate change, like how to get people, you know, students back into school during a pandemic? Have you seen examples of uh, children really leading the way here where we can learn some lessons from them and hopefully countries and governments can do the same? Well, Priyanka's comment about climate change, I think is perfectly on. Uh, young people care about this issue so much and they want to roll up their sleeves and do something about it. So one of the areas that UNICEF works very hard on is water and sanitation. It is important to be able to have running water and a bar of soap so that you can wash your hands in the time of COVID. But it's also important that you have water that you can drink that's clean, that you will not be getting cholera or other diseases. And at school, it's really important that there be um, a bathroom and a bathroom particularly set aside for girls who are adolescent so that there is hygiene, water and sanitation that is surrounding every child as an ecosystem. Water means our planet. It means climate change. They want to do something practical, pick up straws or bottles in the ocean or help with water in their communities. So I think part of our challenge is how to make them equal partners so that they can help um, change the world around them, their communities, their schools, their homes, and that we are playing our part as good partners but it's solutions, it's not just advocacy. And that's at least something that we see very strongly among young people and Priyanka just spoke to one. <laughs> I mean, I have to add to this, in my years of working with UNICEF, the one thing that I have seen is children taking charge of their futures in their own hands. Um, in, in so many places in the world I have seen, like especially with UNICEF partnering with, um, in, in UNICEF India with a lot of communities and creating community centers. The greatest thing about the work that UNICEF does is there's no cookie cutter you know, ideology. There's no like same kind of um, solutions for different countries. They align with communities. They align with kids in communities, adolescent kids in communities and help give them resources to figure out solutions within their own communities, a peer-to-peer -peer program. I've seen so much success with that in, in so many countries around the world that I've traveled with them with. Um, you know, girls who, um, especially when it comes to like not having bathrooms, not having clean water or advocating education over child marriage. I've seen kids who have turned their parents' opinions and turned their community's opinions and stopped child marriage and made sure that girls are in their own neighborhoods, in their own communities, go to school. They have created entrepreneurship. There was this one girl, Sunita, that I met in India. I love telling her story because she was pulled out of school because her, both her parents were unwell and she was going to be married off and um she said no i don't want to be married off i can actually help help you you know uh, with an income and her mother used to stitch clothes and she started learning how to stitch while going to school eventually created a business bought a sewing machine bought three sewing machines mm -hmm. and eventually created a small business in her village where women were trained and they sold clothes and you know had a, a financial return and this is a 15 year old girl who created a revolution within her community and i've seen that around the world so much that it's it's wonderful to see um and these kids are so um so passionate about taking charge of their own life we just have to give them the ability to do it the empowerment to do it and that empowerment is often, it, it can be financial, it can be social, it can be emotional. 
how do you prioritize how to, when you see sort of a seed like that, how do you nurture that and, and grow that so that it does blossom into something that's bigger and that adults start taking notice and they actually learn from the children? I think for me, specifically being an ambassador for UNICEF, my job is to be a conduit um, to the world, to for the world to be able to see and for me to showcase stories of children that are not just inspiring to me, but to the rest of the world. One of my um, most amazing trips that I did with UNICEF was to Zimbabwe. And I remember I showcased a lot of stories on my socials and talked about individual girls that I met or kids that I met. And I remember the impact of that. People still ask me about those girls. They're still talking to, and I still stay in touch with them. Um, and it's so wonderful to actually be able, and that's literally my job, is to make sure that, you know, they're not forgotten. Um, and I remember one of the trips that I went to, a, a little girl did ask me, she gave me a bracelet that she had, and this was in Jordan. Um, and it was one of her only prized possessions because she was in a refugee camp from uh, Syria for about seven years. She had this bracelet, she gave it to me. And she said, um, you know, I know you're gonna go wherever you're gonna go to the world, meet a lot of other children, don't forget me. And I'll never forget Saba's face when she said that. Um, and you know, these children, I think the, we, when we look around our communities, just as individual people, UNICEF obviously is doing really large work, but as individual people, when you look around your home or when you look around your neighborhood, you know, there's always someone that you can help, um, whether that's financially, like you said, whether it's emotionally, whether it's just showing compassion and empathy the most important thing is to be able to know that no matter how badly off you're in life someone else is worse off than you and if each one of us can think about especially with the children making sure that we give them an empowerment where they feel like they can achieve and they can be successful and they can be ambitious I think that's going to be the greatest win for our generation. Well Priyanka said it absolutely beautifully this notion about one child at a time, one individual at a time, is a really important premise. Um, all of us are different. We all have different hopes and dreams and challenges. But if we can look in our own homes and our own communities for children and young people that we can help, it will make the world a better place. And Henrietta, I'm not sure many people know that um, how much research UNICEF conducts to better understand the status of children around the world. Can you talk about some of the major research initiatives that you're uh, pursuing and about the data and evidence-based approach that UNICEF takes? Yes, well, I'm delighted to because we've got a new research report coming out. It's called Averting a Lost Generation. And the idea is, that we want to dispel the myth that children are not being impacted by COVID. And uh, there are a number of areas that are covered, but let me just mention a couple of them. One is on immunizations. You know, when children are young, under the age of one or under the age of five, it's very important to get routine immunizations because there are very preventable childhood diseases. Uh, in the last uh, four years or so, deaths from measles are up 50% and we think 2020 is going to be even stronger because parents are a bit worried about going to a neighborhood clinic to give their children a vaccination and yet we do not want measles and polio and other diseases that uh, stalk the world and stalk children to gain a foothold and that more children will die from that so we try very hard to encourage immunization. UNICEF in the 1980s, early in the 80s, uh, began with a vaccination campaign. And at that time, children, only 20% were vaccinated. A decade later, 80% were vaccinated. It made an enormous difference in child survival and in the health of children. So we want to encourage everyone to see the data, to see what's uh, at stake, if immunizations do not take place. So immunization is gonna be very important to all of us. We also have some very good data on the education um, revolution and the education effect of what's happening during COVID-19 on children. How children learn, how much they lose if they are even out of school for four weeks at a time. Remedial classes are now going on in many countries so that the children can take their final exams. 
but we have to be very alert to how learning takes place in our world. And a third one is an area, Alice, that you've done work in, which is mental health. Mental health is now a serious issue and this generation wants to talk about it. They want uh, to make sure that we know that they are stressed. They are, there's a high level of anxiety. There's lots of consideration of self-harm and even suicide among adolescents in the world. There's also a depression and anger. We have to be make it okay to talk about mental health and to really help this generation because it's going to be with us for decades to come. And how it affects children will be in this report and the data that we currently have, but we need much more. And this is a call that evidence-based data will make a difference for all of us as we look to the solutions that we can put in place for young people. And Priyanka, you created the Priyanka Chopra Foundation for Health and Education, the focus on children um, in India. Can you tell us about what you've been hearing about how the pandemic, how COVID-19 has impacted the children there? I mean, it's, it's to see what has happened with COVID um, for people who don't have the luxury to be able to socially distant people who are living in slums or um, who are living in refugee camps or kids who are, um, you know, within families that, you know, live in extreme poverty. It's, it's such an urgent need right now, especially like the migrant worker crisis, for example, in India, where there was mass migration from as soon as COVID shut down and the lockdown happened and India was under lockdown for a really long time, mass migrations of people from urban cities going back to their villages happened, but there was no transportation for them. There was not enough transportation and we weren't equipped, I guess, to, to be able to um, handle that. And there were children who you know, didn't have food, people walking for days to be able to reach their villages. Um, and, you know, more than COVID-19, they were afraid of hunger. Um, and that was a really, really difficult thing to see and, um, and, and is still affecting so many people around the world in developing countries specifically where poverty is, is um, you know, is, is really, really extremely rampant. And we have to make sure that, and UNICEF is doing so much work with them. I, I know UNICEF India definitely was, and I know UNICEF around the world is doing so much work with children who have been specifically impacted in, in the poorer communities um, where um, now they get married off at a younger age, they are dealing with malnutrition. Um, the concern is, um, they don't even get the ability to think about will we be able to go back to school because the basic um, access to water, the basics are just denied to them at the moment. So it's extremely urgent that the world look out for those children. Is there anything that you see that gives you hope even when we look at the situation and the status of children now, what gives you hope when you consider where we might be in five years or 10 years? I think there's lots of hope and Part of it is uh, just what Priyanka was saying. It's in the eyes of the young people that you meet. There are so many dreams and exciting opportunities before them. And they're really ready to go. They're ready to take on the world. So when I was in Lebanon, I visited a class of um, primarily girls who uh, decided that they were going to gather into something called Girls Got IT or Girls Got It. And they were having so much fun and they do um, uh, mentoring with other women who are in jobs and they are graphic designers. They're using IT in lots of different ways. And the girls are so excited and they're going to change the world. And then in South Africa, there's techno girls and they've, they, they have it. This is an exciting generation, Alice. It is one ready to go. We just have to help give them a little platform. And if we can connect every school and every learner to the internet, I think they will be off and running. And UNICEF is working really hard to make that happen. They are aligning with partners around the world to make sure that connectivity is something that children don't have to worry about. Um, the internet is something that they can access in this new world. And like Henrietta said, the generation right now is kicking and raring to go. When you meet these children who are leaders, you know, I, I look back and I'm like, oh my God, at 17 or 16, I, I did not 
know as much as you do. I didn't have the awareness that you did. And with information being um, at the palm of their hands with this generation, with the internet, these kids are informing themselves. They are they are ready to make sure that they change the world for the better. That they they make it better than they leave it better than they found it. And I hear so many kids saying that to me. So I feel like it's such a hopeful time that the planet is going to be inherited by a generation of spirited, amazing children. And um, and I think that's the hope. The hope is even during a pandemic when you see so many kids coming out there and helping. Um, their communities, their ch children, their friends. You see so many people during the uh, during the pandemic also coming out and try to help their own communities. To me, that was an extremely hopeful sign that humanity is not lost yet. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us on Time 100 Chats. It was a pleasure having you both. Thank you so much, Alice. Thank you so much, Henrietta. Thank you, Alice. Thank you, Priyanka.